Yeah, you know, first work, work in Silicon Valley. Algorithms. Everyone writes a computer program. So I wrote this algorithm. Everyone writes it. Where does the word algorithm come? Al Khwarizmi, a man in the ninth century, he was the one who invented algebra and he wrote these algorithms, which are used not only in computer programs, but in all of the scientific endeavors. An algorithm is, is an equation, but you know, there's much more to it than that. Who invented it? The Muslims did it. Al Khwarizmi, algorithm. Anytime somebody says the word algorithm, he's paying tribute to this genius, Al Khwarizmi, who lived in uh, uh, Persia in the ninth century, responsible for the invention of algorithms. He also worked in the uh, in the uh, uh, Baitul Hikmah in Baghdad for a while. Chemistry, chemia. The Muslims were interested in curing diseases. They were also interested in transmit, uh, transferring one type of metal into another type of metal. So they invented the science of chemistry. The two-axis gimbal. What is a two-axis gimbal? See, in space hardware, when you want to look in one direction in another direction, you need some way of articulating it. And this was done in the 13th century at the time of the Mongol invasions by Nasir al al-Tusi. Nasir al al-Tusi was a great mathematician. He was also the one who invented the concept of infinity. As there's so much to say. But see, basically the concept of zero was invented by other civilizations. The Mayans and the Indians invented the concept of zero. But the concept of infinity was invented by the Muslims, the Arabs. Nasir al al-Tusi, he was the one responsible for the invention of the concept, as also the two-axis gimbal, which is used in space hardware, as well as in little small maps. You, know, you see, provide a, a little a, a globe to a child, rotates in two dimensions, two directions. Muslim invention. They did it. optics. I wear glasses, and so many of us wear glasses. How many of us know that optic was invented by a Muslim physicist? That's uh, Ibn Haytham. This was in the 9th and the uh, 10th century. He uh, advanced the theory that light propagated in straight lines. Up until that time, people thought that light emanated from the eyes. <laughs> when you look at some of the thought, eyes would come, light would come from our eyes. It was he who pointed out, no, no, the light doesn't come from your eyes. The light comes from outside into your eyes. And he invented the pinhole camera. He took a box, put a pinhole in it, and had light rays coming from the outside. Some say it was he discovered it when he was in, in jail, but that, that's another story. In any case, he discovered the pinhole camera. And after the pinhole camera, he did a lot of experimentation on optics using glasses. So anytime we use glasses, we pay homage to this great man. Optics invented by, by them. Disinfectant. Anytime we have a little cut, we use a disinfectant. Where does the idea of disinfection come from? There's again, an Arab invention, a Muslim invention. That was uh, Abu Ali Sina. He used uh, mercury chloride as a disinfectant. An invention, a discovery. He was a great man. And one can talk about him in two different sessions if we wanted to. Then we have the grafting of trees. You know, we eat all this beautiful fruit. Spain, in particular, was highly advanced in the grafting of trees. They brought in this fruit from North Africa, Middle East, India, because the Islamic Empire extended all the way from southern France to the borders of India, that is, Indus River, extended up to the borders of China in the north, and the Sahara Desert in the south. It's a huge mass. So the Muslims of Spain, it was a very highly advanced civilization. They brought in these fruits. They experimented with different kinds of grafts, grafting of trees, grew different crops, and introduced these crops into Europe. Again, a, a, a gift of Islamic civilization. In general, the so-called scientific method, the empirical method. See. 
The Western civilization is great in taking credit. They say, we invented science. How many times have you heard that? It's, it's a very broad subject, and, and it requires a, a, a great many discussions to communicate to our young people what it was that was communicated, but was not communicated, the, the uh, limitations of the process of science and so on. But the empirical method, this is a very important point. The empirical method was a gift of the Muslims to the world. Up until that time, it was the philosophical method. Philosophy is an enemy of science. And I'll come back to it. One of the reasons the Muslims fell behind was because they took on the philosophy of Europe and using the philosophy of, of the Greeks, they tried to explain some of the things that they believed in. The approach of the Quran is not philosophical. It is empirical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe as signs. There are signs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every atom, in every leaf, in every galaxy, in the earth, the sun, the moon. There are signs within us. These are all signs. And these have to be looked at, measured, understood, and then you build the models. Philosophy must be a servant of science. Science must not be a servant of philosophy. The empirical method, the method of measurement, and using measurements to build theories, and using theories then to understand the world of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was the contribution of the Muslims to human civilization, not Europe. Europe did not discover the empirical method. Laminated wood. Many of you are in construction. Anytime we take laminated wood, press it, who invented it? Laminated wood was invented by Al Jazair in the 12th, 13th century, early part of 13th century. Graphite epoxy, advanced composites that are used in space sciences, it was invented by Al Jazair. Laminated wood. Anytime you build a house, anytime you have uh, a construction, pay attention to, or at least remember, or pay homage to this great man, Al Jazeera, who took uh, pieces of wood, laminated together, built something that was much stronger than every piece uh, attached to it. Should I stop? Mm -hmm. Is it working? It's, it's working. It's fine. Well, let's keep going then. Shall we keep going? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Robotics. You see, the world is now moving in the direction of robotics. This, this, these are robotics is the wave of the future. It's the technology of the future. The wars in the future will not be fought by people. They'll be fought by robots. We already have these drones. See what the drones can do. We already have robots to do so much work in the workshop. When you manufacture, you go to a Japanese uh, uh, workshop, a Japanese uh, place of manufacture, you hardly find people in there. A person here, a person there, all the work flows from one robot to the other. Robotics is the way of the future. Who invented robotics? Was again Al Jazeera. Great, great man. I would humbly recommend that every young person, your son, your daughter, your grandson, your grandson, must know something about Al Jazeera, one of the greatest of the engineers who ever lived. He invented so many different machines, the cam gear, the ability to convert rotary motion into a reciprocating motion, which was the basis for the building of railroads. Uh, gear, the uh, not helical gears, but uh, spur gears, uh, the horizontal spindle machines, uh, a, a clock uh, that uh, opened up a certain hours that you have seen in Disneyland, for instance. <coughs> uh, robotics that served you water. He even had a machine that, in the beginning, as soon as you came to the wash basin, gave you soap, and then after you wash your soaps, another window would open. There would be another machine. It would give you a towel to dry your hands. And then that 
window was closed, and there would be a third window that will open and give you another mannequin would come in and give you another piece of towel to wipe your face. Great man, Al Jazeera. Such was the height. These were the achievements of the people. Then let's keep going on. Economics. We have experts in here, in the World Bank and so on. Who invented the bank? See, when you look at the description of economics in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, in Surah Al-Baqarah, He asks us to document when we loan some money to other people, or when we borrow money. It has to be documented. And obviously, without riba, that is forbidden in Islam. The principles of banking are there in the Quran. The Muslims apply the principles of banking so that in the process of their trade, which extended all the way to Spain, to China, they were able to negotiate instruments from one part of the Islamic world to the other. Very often the trade was in barter, but sometimes it was also through these instruments of trade, banking in a rudimentary sense, was invented by the Muslims. Multiple bore guns. Now we come to the post-Mongol period. Do not believe anyone who says that the Islamic period came to an end with the Mongol invasions. It did not. Yes, we, we suffered a major blow, as we'll see later. But the process of invention, educational reform, continued well into the Mughal era, into the Ottoman era. The multiple boar guns, Akbar and his son Jahangir, they invented a seven boar gun, and I have pictures of it, so that you could sit down, a soldier can sit down and fire seven shots, one after the other. <coughs> seven boar guns invented by the Mughals. The hookah, you know, people, it's not recommended, but just mentioning it. The hookah, nicotine, uh, tobacco was inserted in and brought in from the uh, uh, new world into the old world, and it spread all over, and people were getting sick. So the Mughals invented the hookah. Basically, it's like taking the uh, exhaust from the burning of tobacco, passing it through water, so the nic nicotine would dissolve in water, and you would be less susceptible to nicotine and lung cancer from it. It was invented at the time of the Mughal Emperor Akbar in the year 1605. Hookah, invented by the Muslims. Now, <coughs> observatory. Even now, if you go to Delhi, there is an observatory. It's called Jantar Mantar. It was built in the decaying period of the Mughal Empire. These observ observatories were built by emperors all the way from Central Asia, Iran, uh, not so much in uh, the Arab part of the world, but certainly in Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, India. These observatories were used for the observation of the heavens and also to calculate the time of prayer. Many observatories were built. Supernal geometry, the Taj Mahal. Can you construe, can you imagine any other civilization building the Taj Mahal? I cannot. I'll give you a reason why. Because people do not know that the Taj Mahal is not construction. It is not architecture. The real inventor, the real conceiver of the Taj Mahal is Ibn al-Arabi, who passed away in the 13th century. Ibn al-Arabi had a manuscript. See, he was, I, I, this, this will go into a digression, but allow me to share some, some thoughts about him. He was a great mystic, not just an ordinary, great, 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 great mystic. He had, on a piece of paper, conceived of what the, the Rosa Masha, the day of gathering, would be like. And he said, if the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here, then the gatherings of people would be here, and this would be the arrangement. This manuscript was in the possession of Emperor Shah Jahan. And he used that manuscript as the basis for the design of the Taj Mahal by Lahori. He was from Lahore, from Pakistan, the designer of the Taj Mahal. So the real architect of the Taj Mahal was Ibn al-Arabi. And 
People say, where is Islam? In Islam. Any other civilization? Can it build the Taj Mahal? Where is Islam? If Taj Mahal is not love, what is it? Supernal geometry, namely, functional geometry was there since the time of the Greeks. What the Muslims did was to say, there is functional geometry, but there is supernal geometry, meaning geometry that conveys the inner meaning of the structure of the universe, arabesque. The, the calligraphy is the same way. Persian rugs are the same way. Taj Mahal is the same way, the arabesque. The ability to project functional geometry into its inner meaning so that it elicits the, from the spirit a guidance towards the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the purpose of calligraphy. That's the purpose of a Persian rug. That's the purpose of the Taj Mahal. Supernal geometry. Geometry at different levels. And lastly, a couple of observations. Music, unfortunately, elicits a very negative response in our circles. But music can be looked upon in two different ways. Music can be looked upon as a branch of mathematics, or it can be looked upon as a branch of, as applied to, to uh, the Sharia. I'm not going to talk about the Sharia. I'm not going to talk about its application in religion. But as a branch of mathematics, music is fundamental because it relates to the behavior of electromagnetic waves, relates to the behavior of earthquakes. Uh, the uh, analysis of harmonics is fundamental to the behavior of physical objects. Um, they're always there. The uh, Muslim physicians, the, the uh, physicists, analyze music from a mathematical perspective. I emphasize, look at it from a mathematical perspective, you'll stay out of trouble. If you mention music as a part of religion, you'll be in trouble. As a discipline in mathematics, they analyzed it, they cataloged it, and they built many instruments. Sitar, sarod, lay, guitar, all of these came from Muslim uh, musicians. They are the ones who designed them, not to, to uh, somehow um, make themselves happy, as, as do some people who engage in music, but to understand how it is that the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to think about him and to rise up to the, the presence of his name. Lastly, coffee. Everyone drinks coffee. And this was one contribution, Brother Farooq, that was the contribution of uh, the Sufis. The true story. In Yemen, this happened in the uh, uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century in the, uh, the, the Khan Khas of Yemen. The story goes, one day, these people were taking a walk through the meadows and they saw these goats. You heard the story. And these goats were eating coffee beans. And they looked so happy. They came back. They said, OK, let's try it. And soon enough, they discovered, yes, indeed, this, this is a good thing for us, whatever it was. And from there, there was one great uh, Sufi sheikh, Baba Budhe. He brought some coffee beans from Yemen to the western coast of India, and he planted them there. And there is a mountain named after him called Baba Budhe Giri, the mountain of Baba Budhe. He planted that so much so that by the time the British arrived in India, that whole area was full of coffee. The British took over, of course. There were the rulers and they brought the coffee to other parts of the world, to Africa, and then later on, now of course it's all over the world. So anytime you drink coffee, my brothers and sisters, take credit for it. Say what? Whether or not you like it. It doesn't really invent it. Enjoy a sip of coffee. I'm not suggesting it. But at least remember, it came from our people. Take credit for it. At least take credit for it. They have a cup of coffee. Our forefathers invented it. So now, that is the introduction to some of the great, great inventions and discoveries that our forefathers had.
to somehow recap some of the names, very rapidly I'll read some of the names so that we have them for the record. We have Jabir ibn Hayyim, who was the inventor of chemistry. Al-Hindi, credited with inventing the empirical method, the scientific method. Al-Khwarizmi, credited with the invention of algebra and algorithms. We're all in Silicon Valley. Every time you write an algorithm, take credit for it. So we, we did it. Why not? Ali Dirisi, the geographer, the geographer who in the 11th century mapped out most of the old world. That had not been done up until that time. Al Masudi, historian, the empirical method in history was an invention of the Muslim. See, people talk about Herodotus. Herodotus was a storyteller. Storytelling is not history. History is to look at the patterns in human behavior so that you learn something from it and apply them <coughs> so that you understand the works of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does Allah teach us as a society, as a civilization? So that if we violate justice, for instance, we destroy ourselves. How does Allah teach us that if we follow justice, if we are just, if we are, we follow the Nizam, then we make progress. That is history, the interpretation and understanding of the events to make some sense so that we use them for the advancement of civilization. That was a Muslim contribution, not a Greek contribution. Not a Greek contribution. Al-Farabi, master of logic. Ibn Sina, you know his name, the greatest physician of the Middle Ages. Al-Hazm, the father of modern optics. We talked about the glasses. I had my glasses changed yesterday. That was a good thing. Al-Hazm, thanks to Al-Hazm. Al-Biruni, Afghan, one of the greatest of Afghanistan. <coughs> I pay homage to my good friend here. He's my elder brother. Afghanistan has produced many great personalities. Unfortunately, it's in bad shape today. All the way from Imam Abu Hanifa to Al-Biruni, and others, great, great thinkers. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Maulana Rumi from, from Afghanistan. Al-Tusi, the inventor of the two-axis gimbal, the conceiver of the Tusi couple, and the conceiver of the idea of infinity. Ibn Rushd, the rational philosopher, the greatest rational philosopher after Aristotle. Ibn Khaldun, the father of history, the father of historiography, the father of modern economics, the person who correctly analyzed the impact of taxation upon society. Ibn Khaldun, back in the year 1400. Muammar Sina, if you go to Turkey, do visit some of the great constructions of this great man. Muammar means the engineer, Muammar Sina. He knew about earthquakes. He not only took what we had inherited from the earlier civilizations, added so much to it, so much so that his contributions now adorn that entire region of Anatolia, the uh, European part of uh, Turkey, and in Europe as well. Great man. Then we have Ustad Lahori, the architect of the Taj Mahal. In the last 400 years, humankind has not produced another structure like the Taj Mahal. You can build a Taj Mahal, but you cannot build a Taj Mahal. It does not have the love in it. It does not have the supernal geometry in it. Supernal geometry because that comes from the spirit. It does not come from the mind. You can be a great mathematician. You can be, be a great architect. You can be a great engineer and still not be able to produce something like the Taj Mahal because it comes from the spirit, it comes from love, it comes from that inner drive. That is the contribution of Islam. So with that introduction, let's ask ourselves, I'll go on to the next phase of the presentation. What are the elements, what enables a civilization 
they meant to discover, to make a contribution, whether it be in the area of natural sciences, philosophical sciences, conceptual sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, whatever, or even in the spiritual context. First, there must be peace. And as we go through our historical presentation, I'll point out why it was that we got to where we are today. There must be peace. If you don't have peace, how are you going to invent? If you are concerned about the safety and security of your family, tomorrow morning you get up and your family is gone, as it happening in Syria today, or it happened in Iraq, or it happened in Libya, or it happened in Afghanistan, or it's happened in many parts of Pakistan, how can you invent? Peace is a prerequisite to scientific endeavor. And peace could be internal and external. In other words, internal peace, the ability to get together for a society, and external peace, freedom from invasion, as happened in the case of the Mongols. And we'll go into that. Peace is essential. Consolidation, political and economic consolidation, because investments are necessary. And when I later on describe to you the history of the Maghrib, and its relationship to how it developed vis-a-vis -vis the Spaniards and the Portuguese, I'll illustrate to you how it was that the Maghrib, that is Morocco and Algeria, did not go through the revolution that the Spaniards and the Portuguese did. Consolidation is necessary. You need investment. You need money. And that investment comes about either through, you have to have either an empire, a king who gives you money, a kingdom which supports science, a political structure that supports science, similarly economic consolidation. I will point out later as we go how it was in the 18th century the joint stock company was one of the major inventions of humankind that accounted for the advancement of Europe from where it was to the domination of the world. Consolidation so that you have the resources. Without the resources, you cannot be invented. Then we come to what Allah SWT teaches us. We should have started with it, but I wanted to give this as an introduction. Allah SWT teaches in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, while ask, Inna al-insana lafi khus, illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tawasa bilhaq, wa tawasa bilsab. No one needs to say a word beyond that. It's all there. Everything that we want to know is there. Everything that anyone wants to know about history, what makes a, a civilization possible, what destroys a civilization is all there. Inshallah, we'll go into it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here takes an oath. Well, Allah is taking an oath. Allah himself is taking an oath. Well, us, but what? The passage of time. Time is a mystery. I don't want to go into it because that will take me two hours to discuss it. He takes an oath on the passage of time and then he emphasizes it twice more. Inna, that's an emphasis the second time. Inna insana la la, that's another emphasis. Two emphases and one oath. How much more can divine voice communicate? With what intensity can it communicate to the human soul so the human kind listens? He says, I will take an oath and I'll emphasize it twice in al insana that because in, indeed humankind is at a loss. No matter what you do. The Quran says, doesn't matter what you do unless you do the following. In al insana that because in the ladina amun. First, faith. Amun. Wa amilu salihat. Good deeds, beautiful deeds, the truthful deeds. Each one of them is a subject matter. One can discuss them for ages and ages. In the ladina amun, wa amilu salihat. Tawasa, very powerful word. Working together. We'll talk about it. The Muslims work together, we'll talk about it. Put three Muslims in a, in a room, you'll come back with four parties. Tawasa bil haq, or what haq? Inshallah, in the next khutbah, I've been asked to give the khutbah the next time, I'll just discuss the meaning of haq. Such a Beautiful. 
truth, justice, rights, responsibilities, what you owe, what you don't owe, uh, reality. All of those things are in there. So those who work together for what? Truth, justice, rights and responsibilities with patience and perseverance. They are the people who are not in a loss. That's, that's the, that's the uh, essence of it. Without faith, there is no civilization. No Iman, no insult. There is no other way to put it. If you don't have it in the heart, it does not work. You can do whatever you want. It does not work. The civilization will come to an end. Pharaoh had a good civilization. When I say good civilization, mighty civilization. So did the Persians. So did so many other civilizations. Why did they flop? Why, why did they come apart? Why do so many Muslim dynasties come apart? It's all there. So faith is essential for scientific invention. Legitimacy of rule. Once again, I'll come to that when we talk about the Maghrib in one of the later sessions. I'll point out to you precisely how it was that the issue of legitimacy of rule was responsible for the decay of the kingdoms of the Maghreb in the 11th and the 12th century and the destruction of Muslim Spain later in the 13th, 14th, 15th, ultimately in 1492. Legitimacy of rule. Whoever is the Imam, whoever is the, whoever is the uh, uh, leader, the president, the king, whatever, it doesn't matter. People must feel he is legitimate. Even in a small organization, the person who leads must have the follow the, 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 the faith of the people so that they feel this man is legitimate, this lady is legitimate, otherwise it does not work. Legitimacy of rule, structures, political, social, and other structures, that's the economic structures. Whatever the structures there are, do they support innovation? They don't support innovation. How many innovations have come out of the Islamic world the last 200 years? Can we count them? Why? It's all there. Again, it's all there. It's not a mystery. Structures. Then, the scientific outlook, the freedom. One of the things that has happened to the Muslim world is that we do not have the freedom to think. What has happened is that we have taken a religion that was given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that extended from heaven to heaven. The Prophet came in the full blaze of history. He gave us a faith that extended from one horizon to the other, embraced all of the kaina. And then we gradually started to constrict it. And I'll go into it little by little, little by little, until that faith that used to embrace the totality of Allah's creation became like a one-dimensional one. You move to one, one side, it is haram. It's another side, it's kuf. And the third side is bida. And the third and fourth side. What has happened to us? You must have the freedom to think. Even in the creation of Iblis, and this is a philosophical statement, I ought not to make it, but I am in the company of people who are thinkers. Even in the creation of Iblis, there is wisdom. If it was not for Iblis, there would not be any man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom encompasses all of creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Iblis so that Iblis would try to mislead human beings, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave insan that rule which is animated by the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance that comes to us from our prophets, and we overcome the temptations of Iblis. It's a very powerful statement. So that we must have the freedom to sa'ala, to ask. See, people say sa'ala, to ask. We have scholars in here, Arabic. My good friend, Abdullah, brother Abdul Latif, I consult with them all the time. Sa'ala is to ask, but it, the more important, the, the correct meaning of sa'ala is to seek. You must be seekers. You must ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must ask. If you don't ask, what are you going to get? You must ask. 
Every atom in the universe, every galaxy, every planet, the sun, the moon, you, I, every cell in our body asks Satyam. Every cell in our body asks Satyam to be alive. Otherwise, we would be dead. Everything in the universe asks him. Every moment, yes, Allahu man fi samawati wa ta'ala. Kullu la yawmin huwa fi shah. Kullu la yawmin. Yawm is not a day. Yawm could be a, a, a second. Yawm could be a day. Yawm could be a year. Yawm is just a word. It's a measure of time. Huwa fi shah. You see there, there, there are, there are subtle meanings in there. What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only gives, he gives with shah, with majesty. Not only does he give, he gives with majesty. So we don't ask. Why? We are afraid. There must be freedom from fear. Faith must be free from fear. Religion must be free from fear. If you are afraid, be afraid of Allah, but not of people. Be afraid of the day of judgment. Be not afraid of somebody else. No, that's not what it is. Because Allah has given us the guidance. The book is there, the Quran is there, the Sunnah of the Prophet is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed the faith of Islam. And yet, unlike our forefathers who took what was given to them by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, applied it, and have gone over only some of the great achievements that they had. Unlike them, we are afraid. We are afraid to ask. We are afraid to move. We are afraid to think. We are not afraid of Allah. If we are afraid of Allah, we would not be doing some of the things that we do. No. People are not afraid of Allah. They have forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they are afraid of people. They're afraid of the structures. They're afraid of the rulers. They're afraid of whatever money. And I'll stop here for a few seconds by relating to a true story. This is the story of Ibn al-Arab. Ibn al-Arab at one time, he was, a, he was a great, great sheikh. I'm not going to use the word out here. Great sheikh. One day he was in Damascus. And he stood in a spot. And he was thumping his feet on the ground. And he said to the people around, what you worship is under my feet. He said that in the bazaar. And people were so, so upset over that. What do you mean? He says, what you worship is under my feet. So I got into some chronicles. They, they got rid of him, whatever they did to him. But it was not a happy ending for him. 400 years later, when Suleiman Khaluni, the Ottoman Empire. See, the Ottoman Empire captured the Mamluk Empire in the year 1517. And then proceeded on. Uh, uh, Suleiman Khaluni was the second one after uh, the first one who became the Khalifa. And then he asked people, where did uh, Ibn al-Arabi stand when he made this statement? And people 400 years later said, that's where. And he said to his soldiers, D. So they dug and dug and they found money, gold in it. Mm -hmm. So you see, what he was saying was that what you worship is you're worshiping gold. <laughs> it's under my feet. This is what has happened. What I'll do is take a little small break for about five minutes. We'll come back and inshallah we'll get started with an introduction to, to Islamic history. We'll go as long as we possibly can go. But I'd like to have about 15 minutes to half hour of interaction so that we get the input from, from all of uh, our scholars in here uh, because the idea is to learn. This is not a lecture, this is a sohbet. It is a companionship. Some of us know a little bit more than some other people. We need to learn from each other. That's the whole idea of it. So five minute break and then another 15, 20 minutes of presentation, then a discussion, then there will be prayer, inshallah. What I'll do is to condense uh, history, because if we go into the details, 
of uh, historical exposition. It may take us uh, many, many different sessions to stop us, if you would. So what I will try to do is to focus on those events in Islamic history that had a bearing on the intellectual landscape of Islam. We are familiar with the history of our Prophet Muhammad We are also familiar with the history of the Sahaba, especially the Ulfaya Rashidun and the first four uh, Hadifas. And we are familiar with the civil wars that broke out on the question of succession to the Prophet we are familiar with all of that. So let's advance to the year 700. This is approximately 68 years after the passing away of the Prophet By this time, the Islamic domains have extended from the northern shores of Morocco to what is today the southern portions of Pakistan, thus from the Indus River to the borders of Spain. And Spain became a part of the Islamic world in the year 707, 708, 710, and southern Pakistan became a part of the Islamic world in soon thereafter, 711, 712, 713, 714, that time frame. So what they did was to bring people of different philosophies together within the realm of, of Islam. And there arose the need of the Mustahideen, the great ulama, to answer the questions that people brought with them. There were, and there emerged, two broad centers of learning around the year 700. One was focused based around Madina al-Munawwara, and the other one was based around Kufa, which is in southern Iraq. The one centered around Madina al-Munawwara was in the womb of Islam, the heart of Islam. And the people of Medina, as we all know, they knew the traditions of the Prophet. Their forefathers, their fathers, their grandfathers had grown up with the Prophet So that the methodology that evolved, that grew up in Medina, was very, for lack of a better word, conservative, very strict in conformance with the verified traditions of the Prophet and the ijma of all of the Sahaba. Hence the Maliki school of fiqh. And I'm not going to go into development of fiqh schools. Each of the schools of fiqh have their own uh, assumptions, have their own hudud, and the own historical uh, guidance that is responsible for that accounts for the small differences that we find on the emphasis on such things as the collective ijma or the ijma of some of the Sahaba or the principle of khiyas and istihsan. I'm not going to go into that. So around the year 700, you also have Kufa. Kufa was in a different situation because Kufa was close to the newly conquered territories of Persia and the territories that were in the process of being conquered in southern Pakistan, which is India. So that the questions that arose in Kufa and southern Iraq were of a different character because here we had an amalgam, a melting pot of the Zoroastrians, who were gradually being converted, and the Hindus from India, who were also in the process of conversion. It's just a passing comment. 
The Arabs did not force their religion upon the conquered people. If you plot the rate of conversion, specifically in Persia, that is Iran, and Egypt, you'll find the following. There was very little conversion up until the year 717, 719, up until the time of Omar Abdul Aziz, anhu. The Arabs left them alone. They established cantonments, they paid jizya, and left them alone. It was Omar Abdul Aziz who reduced the taxes, engaged in a dialectic with the Persians and the Egyptians. The, when I say Persians and the Egyptians, it was the Zoroastrians and the uh, Christians of Syria and, uh, and Egypt. And gradually, the people of Egypt and Iran accepted Islam as a result of the broad-based policies of Omar bin Abdul Aziz in the year 717, 718, 719. Now, concurrent with this, you have philosophical questions. So the ulama of uh, southern Iraq had to answer the questions posed to them by the Persians, the Hindus, and increasingly the Turks who were coming in from Central Asia. These questions require additional latitude in terms of interpretation of the Sunnah of the Prophet so that the people who were listening to the answers absorbed them, understood them, and inculcated them. And hence the Hanafi school of fiqh. The Hanafi school of fiqh has greater latitude in terms of the application of usul of fiqh as compared to the Maliki school of fiqh, which was based upon most of the rulings that took place at the time of Hazrat Amr al and were given by Hazrat Ali al This is not commonly known, but that's the basis. Hanafi fiqh, on the other hand, tends to be much more broad-based because it accepts the principle of istihsa and also it accepts the ijma of at least some of the Sahaba. It does not insist on the ijma of all of the Sahaba. And it also accepts the principle of istihsan. Those were internal matters, namely matters that related to the governance of the Islamic world in terms of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. But the real challenge came from the outside. The Muslims came into contact with Greek philosophy and the thinking of the Zoroastrians and the Vedas of the Hindus and the mathematics of the Hindus. So there arose a need to come to terms with the knowledge base that is being accumulated from Yunnan, which is the, the Greeks, China in terms of technology, the Zoroastrians in terms of their administrative capabilities, the Hindus in terms of their mathematics. They were highly advanced. So in the year 760, and I'm very rapidly going through the Islamic period, the uh, Umayyad period had ended. The Abbasid revolution in the year 751 had taken place. Now the Abbasids are in power in Baghdad. And the Abbasids decide to establish a new capital city in Baghdad. Up until that time, Damascus was the capital. Khalifa al-Mansur decides to establish a new capital. And that is the modern city, the blessed city of Baghdad, unfortunately, has been destroyed. And I'll tell you a few stories. I'll come to answer the question that was raised earlier in terms of the intellectual landscape. Khalifa al-Mansur said, I want to establish a capital city, and I want to find the most renowned architect in the world, anywhere from Spain to Pakistan. Find me that most renowned architect. And people looked around all over the place, and they said, you have him right here in the city of Baghdad, or close to the city of Baghdad, in Kufa. And that was Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa was not only 
Imam al-Azim, one of the greatest of Mustahideen. He was also a great architect, a town planner. And the Khalifa asked him, I want to find a new camp. I want you to come up with a layout. Obviously, we did not have computers those days. We did not have CAD. They did not even have paper. How is the great Imam going to come up with a layout for a capital, for an empire that was the largest empire at that time in Islamic history? So, Imam Abu Hanifa thought about how am I going to convince the Khalifa about the layout? He said, with your permission, O Khalifa, I will collect all the cotton seeds in, in around Baghdad, in the road of Iraq. Let everyone bring the cotton seeds to me. He dried the cotton seeds. He conceived of the layout of the capital city. And he put the he delineated the various important structures and locations that were needed for the capital using these cotton seeds. For instance, he said this is where the Jame Masjid, the Grand Masjid is going to be. He laid it out, cotton seeds all around. This is where the army barracks will be. He laid it out, the cotton seeds. This is where the main thoroughfare, the Shahra, will be. He laid it out, the cotton seeds. This is where the people will live. And he asked the people to build a big tower. To build a big tower, tall tower. And on a moonless night, he asked the Khalifa to come with him onto the tower. And he ordered that the cotton seeds be set fire to. And the cotton seeds were set fire to. And the cotton seeds burn, they have a small amount of phosphorus in them, and they give out blue light. And the Khalifa was able to see the outline of the entire capital city in the darkness of the night. That was his CAD, computer aided design. Great man, an architect. Why am I telling you this? Because the people who emerged after the Khulafai of Rashidin were not just religious in the narrow sense that we define them, but they were also well versed in the sciences of nature, in the sciences of history. Of course they knew the Quran by heart, of course they knew the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, but they were also well versed in all of these other disciplines. Compare them, and I'll compare, make comments as I go, with the way we look upon the, the so-called ulama these days. We use the olive for someone who goes to a little small school and he studies something and comes out and he says an olive. The different comparison. Now Imam Abu Hanifa also was a man who was a mathematician and a scientist. To build a capital you need bricks. And these bricks were not high temperature fire bricks, but bricks that were sunburned and you have to have some kind of standardization. Times were no different those days. He built it in New Capital today. There will be so many contractors. To build an airplane, you have 15 contractors. We had so many different contractors going people to the moon. So all the people got into the business of making bricks because there's money to be made. You need standardization. How are you going to make the standardization? Imam Abu Hanifa said, I want all these contractors to bring these bricks and make the uh, loans, you know, arrange them. A number, I forget whether it's 50 or 100. 100 this way, 50 that way, and 10 this way. So that by the volume of the bricks, for so many bricks, you can tell whether or not these bricks are uniform size. He imposed standardization on brick manufacture. You know, you have a standardization uh, agency in Washington, D.C. that does the same thing. All around the globe do the same thing. Here is a man, architect, standardization. He was a very successful merchant. He had inherited from his grandfather a silk business. His grandfather had migrated from Afghanistan. Those days it was the silk route from China all the way going to uh, what is today Cairo and the Roman, what was remaining of the Roman Empire and so on. He was a very rich merchant, very rich. 
So much so today he would be a new billionaire in Silicon Valley. And I'll illustrate by, by an example. He used to, you know, money, if I used to loan out money to people, of course, without interest. At one time, it is related that he had loaned some money to a person. And it was a hot day. It is very hot in Iraq. So, Imam al Hanifa was walking around. He saw a big building, tall building. And he wanted to sort of relax, to, to stand in the shade to catch his breath. So he stood in the shade. And then, after he'd taken his breath, he asked people, whose house is this? And people said, this house belongs to the man who took a loan from you. And Imam Hanifa started to shake. What? It looks like I've taken a little idafa, a little something extra from this man. And he, here's a man, and I'm taking advantage of his building. So he forgave the loan. Such was the fear that those people had. They were afraid of Allah. Are we afraid of Allah? Such was the piety, the taqwa that they had, the people of taqwa. Are we people of taqwa? In any case, these ideas coming in from especially Iran and India had to be accommodated. Khalifa al-Mansur established the house of wisdom, Bayt al-Hikmah. He said, I'm going to establish in Baghdad a house. Hikmah is a very important word. <coughs> the function of knowledge is not knowledge itself. It is hikmah. Knowledge is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't come from anywhere. He gives it to whom he pleases. Sometimes you see rose gardens blooming out of garbage dumps. Sometimes you see forms growing out of very fertile soil. Allah gives knowledge to whom he pleases. It is not something that can be inherited. You cannot write a check and pass it on to your son. Otherwise, the son of Noah would have been a prophet himself. He did not listen to him. Noah invited him and said, no, I'm going to go up on a mountaintop and I'm going to save myself. Did he save himself? No. So you see, knowledge is a gift from Allah. And wisdom is the essence of knowledge. The essence of the Quran is wisdom. Wisdom and the criteria. Wisdom, hikmah, and the criteria. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hikmah and he gives us the criteria for right and wrong. In any case, the Khalifa said, I'll establish in Baghdad a house of wisdom. But that was the beginning of it. And in there, he brought in the Greeks, the Indians, the Persians, the Chinese, the Arabs, the non-Arabs, the Turks, whoever was capable, he gathered them all together. Such was the confidence of that, that civilization. A civilization that is confident, absorbs knowledge from everybody. You learn from wherever knowledge comes from. That is the meaning of the prophet is saying, to seek knowledge, if you have to go to China, go there. So Khalifa al-Mansur brought in the best scholars of the age to translate works from Greece, Greek, and Sanskrit. From Sanskrit, the works of Aryabhata, one of the greatest of the mathematicians who lived in the 4th, 5th century in northern India. The Siddhanta, the name of the book was, that was translated. Astronomy, mathematics from India, Greek philosophy from Greek, the making of paper and pottery, as we saw, from China. Administrative techniques from Persia. All of these were amalgamated and translated, and out of it, the Islamic Empire created something much more than the sum of the parts. Because the integrated whole is always greater than the sum of the The totality of knowledge is greater than its parts. You know, if you're in systems engineering, you know this. As a systems engineer, what you create as a systems engineer is always greater than the subsystems. They created a civilization that was the marvel of the world that lasted 500 years, 600 years, by the Hikmah. The idea
Aeneas from India were rather easy to accommodate because they involved mathematics and astronomy. So the Arabs took the Indian numerals, adopted them, added the Asharia, which is the decimal system, and built up the mathematics. And later, in, in a generation or two, you have the invention of algebra. And al Khwarizmi also worked in Baitul for a while. But the ideas of Greece presented a special problem. And this is the answer to your question, sir. Greek philosophy is philosophical. Aristotle, Plato, highly developed, highly advanced civilization. And the challenge of the Greek ideas was such that the Muslims had to come to terms with them. The Greek approach is inductive as opposed to what is deductive as opposed to inductive. Deductive meaning you start with a premise and you draw conclusions from it. Inductive is you observe, use an experiment, measure, and then you build your tree of knowledge bottoms up. Bottoms up versus top down. In the top down approach, you start with a premise. Now, instead of going into the very subtle details of it, one of the problems with philosophy is time itself. Time is the culprit. Time has been a culprit with so many different civilizations when they try to understand and expand upon philosophical thoughts. Let me spend a little time on what time is and is not. There is clock time. There is relative time. There is perceived time. If you're in a hot room, time stretches out. If you're in a comfortable room, time collapses. All of these have the foundation in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the matter ascends to him in a day, the measure we are off for you is, is 50,000 years. Like that. Then you have time as energy. Time is something we do not understand, but we cannot get rid of. Even in modern physics, with all of our advanced understanding of the multidimensional nature of the universe, 10 dimensions, 11 dimensions that we talked about, we do not know what time is. And that causes trouble. Time isn't just an explanation. It is a gift from Allah so that in time we have the ability to know Him and serve Him and worship Him. The time that is given to us, these are the days of Allah. Why us? At no time since the time of Adam till the time of judgment, moment of judgment, will there be another person like you. That's how unique you are. That's how beautiful you are. There never was. There never will be another human being like you. If I brought you a diamond, and I said, this diamond is such that there never was a diamond like this any time. There never will be a diamond. So how much is it worth? Amazing. That's how beautiful each one of us is. And Allah gives us time so that in this time, we can get to know Him, serve Him, and worship Him. There is no other purpose for the creation of human beings except that they be the word odd has two meanings. One is to serve, the other one is to worship. Serve as a slave, but slave is not an acceptable word in English language these days, so we say serve. To serve him and worship him. And there's the hadith of the Prophet I was an unknown treasure, and I will that I be known, therefore created. So to know him, serve him, and worship him. Time is something that we do not understand. It is not real. Now, bring it to philosophy. Philosophy is predicated upon an understanding of time. Specifically, what happened in the Islamic period was the following. People used to ask them questions. 
For instance, the nature of God, the nature of the Quran, nature of uh, nature, the nature of man. Now, these scholars, not understanding the true meaning of time or the limitations of time, and I'm making a very important point in here. The difficulty with science, the difficulty with philosophy, the difficulty with matter, people of faith is that they do not know their limitations, the limits, the hudud. If people knew the limits of science, if they knew the limits of philosophy, if they knew the limits of what it is that they're talking about, they would be very humble. They don't know the limits and hence therefore they make such mess of themselves and of civilizations. So these people, they said, people asked them, Quran, well, was the Quran created or not created? Now here is the problem that you face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond time. Cannot. Therefore, in this philosophical context that they're discussing, they said, where are we going to put the Quran? If we say that the Quran was uncreated, it puts the Quran on the same plane as that of the, of the inner essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is unacceptable to us. And therefore, what we're going to say, so, so did these so-called Mutazalites. These were the people who were applying the Greek methodology to Islamic learning, Mutazalites. The Mutazalites were in Baghdad from the year 760 to 846. They said to accommodate this, this difficulty, what we then do is to put Quran in created space. They said the Quran was created in time. Oh my goodness. You can imagine what happened. The whole world started to come down. The Usuli, Ulama, led by Imam Hanbali, rose up in arms. Imam Hanbali was flogged many times in jail because they said this is unacceptable, this kind of a position. Taking about the, talking about the Quran and saying the Quran was created in time is unacceptable. See, what happened was they don't understand the meaning of time. They're applying something without understanding the limitations of time to something that they should not, be, that they should not apply to. The same thing with science. So many scientists apply science to matters saying or assuming that is the truth. Where science is like a skyscraper on wheels. That's the best analogy I can give you. It moves. It, it, is, it is a rela relational truth. It is not absolute truth, it's a relational truth. It takes me off on the side. So what happened there in Islamic civilization, when they, when they came up with this position, the Usuli ulama, the people of Kalam, they rose up in arms. They said, it is unacceptable. That was the origin of the Hanbali fiqh. The Hanbali fiqh came about as a fiqh of protest, unlike the other three fiqhs, which evolved in, in Medina, in Kufa, and in, in Damascus. The uh, Hanbali fiqh arose as a result of the interaction of Islamic civilization with the Mutazalites. So they put up resistance against this kind of an absurd position because the Quran is not created. You cannot apply, a, you, you cannot measure the temperature on the, uh, on the sun with a with, with, with the ruler. It's, it's impossible. One must know the limits of knowledge. This is the problem when you, when you engage in a discourse with people, even learned people. They have not asked those questions. Hence, when you, when you say something, you run into trouble. There is a famous saying to, to Imam Hazrat Ali with the law, and of course other, other Sahab also have said, Imam Ali at one time said, I got two kinds of knowledge from the Prophet One kind of knowledge is something that I share with everybody. The other kind of knowledge, if I were to read and reveal to people, they will chop my head off. And see, the problem with knowledge is that 
people do not understand the basis of that knowledge, the assumptions of that knowledge. You can get a PhD from any school, but if you go to a great school, the professor will ask you, make you understand not just the mechanics, the process of doing something, but also the limits of what you did. What are the assumptions? What are the assumptions of science? What are the assumptions of philosophy? Philosophy is based upon the assumption that time is linear. There is before and after. There is no before and after. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ عَيْدِينَ وَمَا خَلْقًا يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ عَيْدِينَ وَمَا خَلْقًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in between, what is ahead of you, and what is behind you. Namely, He knows the present. You don't. Don't listen to anybody say, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. No, He does not. By the time he knows, it's too late. You don't know what you're doing. All you know is the intent in your heart. Yes, that's, the, that's the inner meaning in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge you for your niyyah. Because the outcome of an action is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't know. You may be driving with the best intention on the highway. You get into an accident and you kill somebody. I mean, are you responsible in the sense of being guilty? You're responsible in a sense, but in a deeper sense. But if your intent was to harm the other person, you're definitely responsible. So time is the culprit. Philosophy is predicated upon the assumption that time is linear. There is before and after, whereas that is an assumption. It is a useful assumption. It helps us understand the relational aspects of the universe so that because we ourselves are relational, we are born, we grow to manhood, we become old and we die, we are also relational. It gives us power over the relational world so that we can discharge the responsibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. That is the usefulness, the utility of time, but it's not the meaning of time. So, people are up in arms. And the Mutazilites, who were the darling of the Abbasid Empire for 86 years, from the year 760 to 846, they were discredited. But I'll share something in here also. When the Mutazilites were in power, that is, when they were forcing their way of thinking upon everybody, Harun or Rashid was one of them, Mamun, Amin or other people uh, associated with them, all of these folks, they allowed the Mutazilites to impose their thinking on other people. And those ulama who were opposed to them, like uh, Imam Hanbali, uh, like him, they were flogged, they were jailed, they were mistreated. And people who did, did not agree with them, they were mistreated. Similarly, in the year 846, when the Mutazilites were pushed out of the court, the anti mutazilites they in turn turned on the Mutazilites and they persecuted them. They burned the books, put them in jail, etc. This is what has happened in Islamic history. The ability to absorb different ideas, integrate them, understand the, the inner meaning of it, the, the limitations of it, and to grow with it, it has not been demonstrated. In passing, I'll mention, since I mentioned Mutazilites, Mutazilites had two other, uh, two other, uh, on two other occasions in Islamic history, they had the ability to influence the flow of history. One was in the Dawla dynasty of India in the year 1320 to 1340. That was 20 years before Ibn Battuta went to India. The Mutazilites were in power. Muhammad bin Tawlaq was a Mutazilite emperor, a rationalist. They did the same thing. They persecuted people who did not agree with them. The, in the, in the Maghrib, in the 11th and the 12th century, the uh, Al-Wahid Empire, they did the same thing. They were opposed to the, the uh, Mutazilite ideas and they burned Mutazilite books. 
the ability to accommodate different ideas has not been shown primarily because of our lack of understanding of time. And even to this day, when we engage in discussions with people, we say, this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this, people don't understand. You see, only Allah and His creation, that is that His name, is beyond time. He knows. He is beyond time. Don't apply time to Allah. Don't ask questions because if you are a four-dimensional creature, which is what you are, time and space, I, you know even today there are 11 dimensions. That much we know. That much in physics we know there are 11 dimensions. In string, there are other universes in the other dimensions so that from the uh, from, from my shoulder to the tip of, of my finger, there may be 500 different universes that I'm not aware of. We don't know that. Don't apply your thinking to the person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is beyond time. That's the message. This is why people fall. Science is a relational. Science is not absolute. It is like building a structure on wheels. It is good. You build a lighthouse, you're on the ocean, and you want a lighthouse, you build a lighthouse. In the old days, you would build an Alexandria had a big lighthouse. Build a lighthouse on rock. But if you use science as a lighthouse to, to find out the truth, then you have a lighthouse on wheels. It moves, it shifts. Every time you have a new discovery, it shifts. Galileo was made to renounce because he said he was dealing with you know, earth-centered coordinates and, and uh, inertial coordinates. That's all it was. He said, the church said, you must talk in terms of earth-centered coordinates. Galileo said, no. Look, it's not the, the sun that goes around the earth. It's the earth goes, oh, what? We're going we to teach you a lesson. So you see, my brothers and sisters, Knowledge is a gift from Allah. It is the, the, it's an ocean. The depths of the ocean are not known to anyone. Hence, it is, these are the people who have intuitive knowledge. And these days, we are even afraid of talking about intuitive knowledge because we have lost touch with it. These are oceans. And these oceans are limitless. Inna a'atoyna kal kawthar. One can talk about it for ages. Kawthar, from the root word kathir. People interpret it in different ways. Alhamdulillah, that's correct too. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something that is boundless. Knowledge is boundless. Do not try to bound it. But when you approach faith, Allah, He is boundless. All we can do is to use all the knowledge as science. Nature is a sign. History is a sign. What we learn from here is a sign. What we learn in school is a sign. Learn from it. Every occasion is a sign. The rain is a sign. The clouds are a sign. The galaxy is a sign. Everything, these are all signs that point to his presence. That's all it is. That is all it is. And had Western science understood that, they would not be in the fix that they are today. They said, we cannot reconcile Trinity with logic and therefore we're going to dissociate them. And hence we ended up with a secular science. Islamic science need not be secular. And the attempt has to be to put science back within the fold of the Sharia. Sharia includes nature. Sharia includes history. It must embrace it as the Imam of Hanifa. That's the answer to your question. Sir. I'll stop in here. I'll take in feedback. And inshallah, the next time when we get together, we'll continue the process of understanding how it was that we arrived to where we are today. Is this a good time to stop? Inshallah. So let me, let me, let me hear from you if I may learn from you.